Hi, welcome to Pop Culture Maniacs' this podcast. Uh, this week, um, you, your hosts are Kieran Fremantle and Jean Hedigan, and we're, our discussion will be on the arts and sports during the COVID crisis. So, Jean, um, shall we get started? Since obviously with COVID, uh, everything's been uh, disrupted, including arts and arts and sports in various forms. I thought um, we we'll, we could tackle it in a few ways, like obviously things like employment, edu uh, entertainment, and sort of wider economic impact, as well as sort of, um, of a sort of more specific issues that have affected these areas. So I thought we'd start with, um, with art, the art, since obviously due to um, COVID, there's been basically any show, shows, concerts, I've not been able to operate at all. And obviously there's that the risk of um, many theatres and companies going under, people, actors losing their jobs and obviously staff at various theatres losing jobs as well. Uh, obviously, uh, in Andrew Lloyd Webber even reckoned that with social distancing, just theatres would not be viable at, at, at the moment and that, um, well, with, particularly with theatres, they do run on a, they do re run on tight num, tight margins as well. Yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, I'm an I'm an avid theatre goer. I go to the theatre constantly. Um, I make multiple trips to New York every year. I try to get to London at least every two years, if not every year, to to see shows. So it's been a huge blow just to my life to not be able to to go and experience, you know, live theatre. But, you know, uh, the Broadway League in New York just announced uh, last week that they're officially closing Broadway through the end of May of 2021. And it's, as you said, not just a massive hit to, to actors and to the shows themselves, but to all the support staff who work on the crews, stage management, um, the front of house staff, and in general, like the, the areas surrounding these theaters. Uh, the stat I saw from the Broadway League is that every year Broadway brings in to not just Broadway, but the surrounding New York City area, almost $15 billion. And to lose that is a huge blow to the New York economy, uh, let alone to, to those who actually work within Broadway. Uh, you know, that was actually a point I was going to bring up a bit later, but because obviously um, a lot of these theatres do have a wider ec economic um, impact as you, and as you said the west end and broadway are big draws for london and new york respectively and uh, as I say plenty and obviously plenty of businesses proper prop up around these um uh, around where theaters are like um obviously the biggest city you know, where i li live where i live near is um Bris it's Bristol, when obviously the big, the biggest theatre there is the Hippodrome. So that's where all the big, whenever there's a big show that does a tour. So whatever, Mamma Mia or um, or Book of Mormon were two I saw there, and obviously lots of there are lots of restaurants by the Hippodrome itself. There's Greg's Pizza Hut and a pub, and over the road there's like Caribbean restaurants and the streets nearby. Loads of different other restaurants, both chain and. Uh, independent of it and a lot of them have like theater specials and it's always good and it's the same with a lot of sport sports teams as well restaurants pu uh, restaurants pubs um burger vans or whatever all base their business around mat say match day or whatever yeah and i mean i know things are slightly different over in the uk um in terms of uh, uh, rescue funds and whatnot that the government's putting together, but yeah, here in here in the states, there's nothing. There's nothing from our government to try to keep the theaters afloat, to try to help prop up any businesses that surround them or surround the various sporting arenas, um, and even just you know just the businesses that surround um, downtown office buildings. So it's it's going to become a dire situation if we can't manage to to get you know sports back up and running or theater back up and running which obviously is, is not really conducive at the moment with uh 
current situation for COVID. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, um, in the UK, we've there have been like gr grants and funds for um, for various theatres and uh, arts venues of various descriptions, but a money was very limited and. Um, obviously a lot of um, people within the artist community do feel that they've been neglected like within britain there's the whole um save the arts ha hashtag and this slightly un well slightly unrelated um the british government they released a poster sort of um an advertisement campaign to get people into um uh, to join cyber security for the government one of them was um it had a ballerina uh, doing her um doing well the dancing shoes they have to wear i can't remember what they were actually called but uh, and it goes fatima's next job could be in cyber in cyber she just doesn't know it yet and at best you can say that the government uh, it was ill-judged or bad bad timing and uh, yeah there have been quite a few parodies of it my personal favourites had Boris Johnson in a tutu going, Boris's next job could be in ballet. He just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> oh yeah, that's ooh, that's short sighted. Yeah. Yeah, there were like other posters, but that one got the most attention. I also quite liked it um, on Twitter, like it said so someone wrote on Twitter, um Hackney's cat uh Catney Council's been hacked, and then someone wrote, "A oh, Fatima's gone rogue." <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the that's the that's the British sense of humour for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we haven't had that here. Um, we do. I mean, the government isn't helping out here or suggesting people switch careers, but. We do actually have something called the Actors Fund, which is um, for anybody who works in the arts, they can contact this fund that's been set up. It's been around for well over 100 years, and they can get um, financial aid for, for rent, for health insurance, that sort of situation. So at least there's somewhere the people in the arts can turn. But, yeah. you know, it's it's been a glaring misstep of, of many missteps in our government's mishandling of, of everything with COVID. Yeah. That they haven't taken time to help the arts community. Yeah, yeah. I think generally with a lot of artists, like as I know, if obviously work short, usually the backup choice is just do something like waiting or bartending or what, whatever whilst, um, whilst their next gig comes along. But uh, hospitality's been really hit by um, the by the crisis so so that fail safe is not even there for a lot of people for a lot of people yeah and and here in the states with the health insurance requirements the way the um unions require um actors and uh, crew members to work a certain number of weeks each year in order to qualify for health insurance and with nothing to do almost everyone's going to lose their health insurance within the next year okay. which is horrific yeah yeah and obviously if some well i was gonna say, well, both um britain and america i think pretty much every major city they all have some sort of theater scene obviously um getting i'll say bath and bristol have quite a few theaters which are pretty well regarded and uh, obviously you think that, that about most british cities in america you can obviously think about every major city has some sort of art scene of some sort like yeah, I mean, obviously every every lame agency has some sort of theatre, some of something really specific like um, Nashville is famous for country music, so loads of country music venues and mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's a it's pretty as I said any major city's been affected. Yeah, I mean just here in Chicago we have a, I would say the the second largest theatre scene in the United States outside of New York and. We've already had a number of, of smaller theaters have to close as a result. And, you know, I, I have a number of theaters that I subscribe to that are trying to create virtual seasons so that they can still pull in money. And it's, uh, it's rough. Yeah, I was, um, in Britain, Britain we've, um, Panto is very popular and they, it's usually a great money maker for a lot of theaters. 
personally I don't like panto but just because I don't like something can't I have to acknowledge other people do <laughs> uh, to keep it afloat this year the national lottery um, have pretty much purchased all the un, um, seats that theatres can't sell out so that they could still operate like a quarter full. Well, that's something. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's better than, yeah. than not having anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, as I said, it's Christmas tradition over here. But then even with about a quarter full, you still think the theatres might struggle because one of the other big revenue streams would be um, would be food and drink. Is it? drink and obviously if there are less people less less of it's going to be sold yeah i mean but i guess if the the choice is no money and money yeah i think they'd rather get something maybe yeah yeah i yeah perf perfectly understandable yeah it's just obviously it's just going to be really hard times for anyone in the in theater theater and any other sort of arts venue um yeah also in, in concerts as well because yeah oof. yeah I, don't, I think that might actually come back later than theater yeah yeah i was going to show still seen a news report on like things like royal ballet just about to start opening up and showing um the, how they counter some of the um um issues like the orchestra has to split be much farther apart than usual because and uh, some of them are actually have to be on stage. Dancers can only dance with someone in their allocated social bubble. So things like that had to be really reworked. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I heard um the mousetrap is going to try to come back in the West End with two separate casts that are in a bubble, so that if if one cast gets sick, then they can just run the other cast. So. <laughs> Double actors, then. Yeah. Yep. Also, um, within the um, UK, I'm not sure if this is done in America, but um, what's actually quite popular is the cinemas. Um, they do like live broadcasts of um, various shows, usually like from like plays from the National Theatre or Royal Shakespeare Company. Sometimes even done like um, the Bolshoi Ballet from Moscow. And for um, something perhaps that could be sort of mutually beneficial for um for both cinema chains and uh and theatres at the moment if they you know theatres could still they operate quarter form broadcast to cine broadcast just cinemas on a saturday or something just to ensure both sides have a bit of income yeah we get um the broad the national theater cinema broadcast here yeah. um and i've also uh, what is it? The the old Vic has been doing um, a couple online performances yeah. throughout the summer. With um, they had one play that had Michael Sheen in it. They had one with uh, Andrew Scott. Uh, one with Claire Foy and Matt Smith. And so they would sell enough tickets for like a five play run of it uh, virtually over Zoom. And so if you bought tickets, you could watch them do a live performance from the old Vic. Which actually was, I, I saw all three of them, and I was actually impressed. It went really well, and it was not quite theater, but it was close. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I would say the only, I think the particular bits of live theater that will truly, truly struggle with this climate of musicals and, and stand-up comedians, because generally they do need to feed off that audience, because you know, with uh, musical theaters, after the big numbers, everyone applauds, and comedians definitely need the need the laughter and feedback just when they're performing yeah and musicals are going to be one of the more complicated ones with you know singing being a huge vector for spread to have that actually get off the ground and have you know 35 singers on a stage together it'll be it'll be hard to see that coming back yeah um what about open air theaters what's it be because Obviously, winter's cut. Winter is coming, so there's probably going to be less open air theaters. But was there much in that in the summer in America? So the only only two official um, theater productions were allowed by the actors' union in the United States over the summer, and one was a production of Godspell um, in 
uh, like upstate New York where they had everyone socially distant, everyone lived in the same house, and they all just kind of like were in a bubble. But they had a, they had one one woman show here in Chicago that was open air that I think did all right. But I I still I think that unions are going to be the issue with getting all the safety standards in place to allow open air theater. But on the flip side, as we've talked about, you know, film and television production is starting back up in the United States. So yeah, I don't know how we're how we can weigh. Okay, you can do film performances with you know 35 crew members but we can't have a small theatrical production indoors so yeah there's yeah. that yeah because um i know during um during the summer um actress rosie day she wrote her first play um people if you don't know her, she's probably best known for like outlander uh she uh because i was actually quite tempted to go because she did uh, a, a a few outdoor venues during the summer since obviously theatres couldn't open for our plate um diaries of a, oh is it, is it diaries of a teenage apocalypse something like something of that something like that what it's called i'm sure i'll put a picture up just to make sure that the, we'll definitely have the right title for our um listeners obviously going going back a little bit because you're saying like the arts arts funding as well because i think you know something like the caravan club in liverpool got funding and i think that's they got it mainly due to um well historical significance and that especially with sort of like those smaller smaller fear um smaller venues they're going to really struggle because obviously if you're going to a gig those can be really tightly packed uh venues and obviously with social distancing measures that's just not gonna gonna be possible as well yeah absolutely and obviously as as we already alluded to sports um the other area that has been gravely affected by um being gravely affected by the crisis we already saw said that um sport um as well lots of sports venues um generate lots of business around like um pubs restaurants and effort um everything uh, in that sort of nature uh, lots of people base their business around it and um and obviously and a lot of uh, uh sports teams make a lot of money from the um match day revenue as well i sent you uh um the other day about the article about the big about project big picture by the premier league which um shall we um it has been rejected, luckily, by the Premier League clubs, but it did seem like it, like some of the man, that Manu and Liverpool were going to try and take advantage of, it, like, don't let a good crisis go to waste. So, because a whole load of um, proposals, so some I think were fairly innocuous, like reduce, um, get rid of the League Cup, which I think a lot of football fans wouldn't be too, especially from bigger clubs, would be too sad to see go reduce the league to 18 teams which would be more like in line with like spain and um germany have a playoff where the 16th place team would would battle the teams uh, some of the teams coming up for promotion stuff um, stuff like that the real um kicker though with the pro- project um big pi- picture w- was it seems to be they'll give um bail out the football league the lower league teams but they the big teams would get more power and it just seemed like a, trying to take advantage to having a power grab yeah and it does raise loads of questions like especially it's all pretty much like they would try like they were suggesting make man U, man city liverpool arsenal and tottenham and um, chelsea uh, they they get their they just wanted to turn the Premier League into a cartel that they wanted more v- voting rights, and it does lead to um, get um, get the rights to sell more of their games directly. And you can ma- imagine, for, um, if you're a football fan, you're more going, you are going to be more interested in like those big matches like Liverpool Everton more so than a. Uh, a game like Burnley Brighton on a cold on a cold Wednesday evening. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy. I mean, because here in the States, um, there absolutely are teams and individual sports that have that kind of power. But each of the leagues is very equitable in the sense that, you know, even the worst Major League Baseball team still has the same amount of clout within the league as, as the best one. So even just to read that, you know, you had teams proposing, you know, hey, we should get a little more voting rights. Like, you know, for for an American, for the American audience, that would be kind of like the Yankees, the Cubs, and the Dodgers saying, guess what? We get, you know, additional power over Major League Baseball because, you know, we draw in the most revenue and, and have, you know, the longest history within the league. But that's just, it's crazy to me that they'd even have the, the gall to kind of propose that as, as part of it. I know, and it's even fans of those clubs who are really against it. I think we'd say football fans traditionally can be a little, they are very traditionalist, um, conservative to about cha- regarding changes to the sports. And obviously, pe- and obviously people do not want to see an Americanization of British sports since we, a lot of teams prop were built up crap from the ground for, um, from communities since teams rarely ever change location in uh, in the UK and when it, and when they do there's usually an almighty backlash and it's, and generally with the prep particularly with football a lot of the big teams in Europe do just want to make, create a European Super League so you can have you know like your Man U's Liverpool's Arsenal's Barcelona Real Madrid Bayern Munich Juventus all these um, various teams to have a Super League and pretty much no one else to be allowed in. But obviously, I said with football, there's so like a certain, there are certain things like people love that, sort of, that the, the smaller team could be a bigger team on the right day, as well as things like, especially a cup match, if you had something like a, um, a smaller lower league team got, um, draw, like say uh, what's a good example? Uh, let's say Gillingham they got drew, they were drawn against Man City at, that could be a big payday for the smaller club and obviously there's that romance as well of the um, of the small team playing the really big the big big team as well and fans would not want to see that go at all yeah I'm, I'm glad they <laughs> I'm glad they shut this idea down. I yeah. I think there's ways to protect sport without creating tears within the sport itself. Yeah. The thing with this big project, big picture, it did get support from the Football League, which is this sort of tier below the Premier League. But that's because they're so desperate for the money at the moment. Yeah. Because um, uh, even before the crisis, a lot of teams were struggling financially, especially the lower down um, you go. Like um, last season, Burnley had to sh- not Burnley, Barry um, had to shut down, which is a team sort of from the Greater Manchester area, and uh, and as the crisis when the COVID crisis hit, Wigan ended up having to declare had to go into administration so they had all the bad things like points deduction relegation and and that sort of thing personally i don't like wigan but i can imagine it being very uh, uh wigan I'll, okay i'll rephrase that i don't like wigan football club i uh, nothing against people from wigan at all better clarify <laughs> better clarify that before i get, get a, a whole town after my after my guts yeah, you got to be careful. Yeah, Premier League going for a power grab in exchange for in exchange for their money because, and the Premier League have not exactly been known for me. They have done stupid ideas proposals before because I remember when I was at uni, they proposed the thirty ninth game where they play at a match abroad, and yeah, that was roundly hated. <laughs> and um, and as I mentioned. A lot of lower league clubs, they're really struggling with the um, lack of um, their lack of attendance since they need that match day income, the ma- ticket money from the tickets and the money from the uh, from 
whatever they sell on the day because um i slightly different sport but because i have done bar work at um at the local uh, the may premier league rugby club near me and yeah they make a lot of money from selling all selling all the drinks yeah it's a, a similar situation here um i mean slightly different in that every state has different requirements of, of what they're allowed for fans yeah. So there's, you know, some American football teams in Florida who have, you know, 20,000 fans in their stadium. And then, you know, here in Chicago, you're not allowed to have fans at all at any sporting event. So some teams are going to be able to make money off of the concession sales and some aren't. But then again, you know, even here in the States, each league is taking a completely different approach to how they're handling uh, yeah. life in COVID from you know, the NHL and the NBA created bubbles for teams so that they ended up with few to no uh, positive tests throughout their playoffs. Then, you know, American football, it's been hit or miss now with rapid testing, but, you know, rapid testing is not super accurate. So there's been outbreaks on several teams. Um, same with baseball. They had outbreaks on several teams throughout their shortened season. And then college football, it's a bunch of college kids trying to live their lives and still play at a high level. And there's been outbreaks at various college campuses. So it's been an interesting experiment to, to see how everyone's handling it here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, there's been similar f things with um, COVID outbreaks in sports teams over here. My team, West Ham, had a co um, a mini outbreak which even forced the manager David Moyes to have to spend two weeks in self isolation so he had to so he was managing from home <laughs> um sale rugby club here they had to um they and they had so their final match of the season had to be postponed because of um a few players had um co had um covid and in the end they ended up withdrawing because they thought we had to withdraw from the last game, which meant they didn't get the playoff. So um, Bath got the uh, Bath got the playoff place instead, which I would say good. But seeing that we got thrashed by Exeter, not so good. <laughs> yeah, in the UK, quite early in the crisis, the government, the British government, bailed out rugby league, which is a different, different sport, different, and it's. <laughs> It did seem like they were willing to bail out a whole sports league, but they're not willing to help out the arts a bit more. I personally, yeah, think, yeah. I think there's a bit of polit politics as well because um, rugby league is very popular in Lancashire and Yorkshire, north north of England. The Conservative Party did well in the north of England in the last election. So they probably realised it's probably not a good idea to make a make a popular um, sport up there fold. Yeah, it's a, a similar similar thing here. Um, you know, sports are seen as kind of everybody likes them, and so if they protect sports or get them out playing again, I mean, even our our president uh, claimed he got the NFL back on on the field, which he didn't, but he claimed it so that it would look better because more people watch an NFL game on a weekend than go to New York to go see a play. So there's also a similar thing with theatre though as well. With sports is um, it's you need the you need that atmosphere and energy of a lot of sports games because um, this weekend there were there have been quite a few local um, major derbies. You had the Old Firm derby in Glasgow and the Merseyside derby in Liverpool, which you obviously um, and obviously they're both being played in empty stadiums and and you like watch any pretty much any sport um like boxing or ufc again a bit weird when there's no audience or audience watching it yeah that was the weirdest thing about um baseball this year was there nobody in any of the stadiums so you could actually hear the players you know yeah. taunting each other on the field which actually made it a bit more fun to watch but just the ca those cavernous stadiums just completely empty it was yeah. crazy to see and it's uh, um with with football and rugby and things they do put pipes and uh, fake 
make uh, of some generic crowd noises so that at least you got something if you're watching it on TV. But it must be so weird if you're a play playing because it must be almost like a training match. Yeah. Yeah, I live by um, Wrigley Field where the, the Cubs play and I would I'd drive by on game nights and you could hear the fake crowd noise, but then they would turn it off in between innings. You could just hear people talking on the field <laughs> from outside the stadium. It was crazy. <laughs> was weird. Yeah. Oh, also, he's got, oh, no, obviously, probably, um, so they're obviously like, there must be procedures, but um, to make sure people are in the same social bubble or whatever. But you get watch some sports like rugby, um, there's a lot of mat contact in that, and you think, yeah, you're not maintaining social distancing or UFC again, where they, you, got, you get two men or two women wrestling each other on the ground. You're not social distancing there. Yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. And I mean, that's going to be the big problem I think we're facing here in the States moving into the winter is that, you know, you know, American football is generally played. Most stadiums are outdoors or at least exposed to the elements. So it's not as troubling as going into like a basketball arena where it's completely enclosed. People are, you know, on top of each other playing basketball. Yeah. It's, it's going to be difficult to get the leagues up and running when they're solely indoors without a bubble. I was going to say, probably I was, but ice hockey would be even worse because they obviously have to keep. Um, well, I've never actually seen an ice hockey game, but I'm guessing <laughs> the I'm guessing the arenas have to be pretty um, cold. Just yes, to main, considering the surface they're playing on. Yeah, it's it's very similar to to you know American football, but on ice. So it's similar hit, similar close quarters, but enclosed. Even the benches where they sit are just on top of each other. And with um, sports as well, like COVID has really affected, obviously, the sports calendar. Obviously, lots of leagues were postponed or uh, cancelled, like um, League One and the Eredivisie in the Netherlands were both um, cut short. Euro, uh, Euro 2020 and the Tokyo Olympics have also had to be postponed to next year as well. Because if it, Japan were really desperate to have the Olympics this year, but they just couldn't in the end. Yeah, and considering how much of a financial blow the Olympics usually end up being to the host country, having to postpone it is going to, oof, that's going to hurt. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, the other side, like, um, sometimes they show, in the UK, they show Australian sports in the morning, like um, rugby league and Aussie rules football. And yet they still... Quite a few places. They still have, they actually have pretty full stadiums. Obviously, it's the summer over in Australia, so obviously different. So obviously, they don't have to contend with um, the the impending winter winter bugs. It's sort of like obviously different countries, different um, rules. Yeah, I mean, I've I've generally been impressed with with Australia and New Zealand and, and how they've pulled through. I mean. Being in being an island where you can restrict entry tends to help, but and, it's, yeah, and yeah, being, I mean, it's great that they still have the ability to play there, though. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you know, other things like um, <laughs> during early during the crisis, I was uh, it were a lot when most leagues were um, having to be have a pause or cancel. Belarus um, kept playing football, and it's like for um people who ended up becoming Belarusian football became very popular suddenly especially um, with gamblers since they actually had something to gamble on that's amazing yeah yeah well, obviously this is a country I have an absolute nut job as a president um, as a dictator oh yeah they've got plenty of other problems that aren't COVID related there yeah with my area again because um, one of the big um, sporting events is the Chelp is the Chelp Gold Cup in Cheltenham for horse racing, and um, when it happened just before lockdown, a lot of people, um, it, lots of people within the UK were saying that it should have been, uh, it should have been cancelled that year because it didn't. There had been allegations that sort of led to a, like a little spike in the due, due to everyone coming coming there or going there. Yeah, we had. 
postponed our big races, I think. I mean, I have a local racetrack by uh, by my parents' house that only opened for racing in ground July and had a, a truncated season. But yeah, I mean, I can't believe they, did they let people into the race by you? Yeah. Did they just, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. It's um because it's sort of horse racing I've ever seen. It's sort of the more, especially those sort of events seems to be more sort of upper class. So if you, you know, you make a big deal dressing up in your a fanciest suit and tie, women you know, it's all wear their fancy hats, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that was like the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness and the Belmont, the, the yeah. big three for the Triple yeah. Crown here. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed what you heard, uh, please like us on Facebook, subscribe, subscribe on down below, follow us on Instagram, t- uh, Twitter, and any other social media platform. Uh, uh, hope, and we'll join you again soon. Cheers. Bye.